Welcome to Cleggan's webinar. Uh, I'm Bruce Calder, I'm VP of Consulting Services here at Cleggan. Um, it's going to be kind of a busy agenda today. Um, we're going to go over a whole bunch of things in Prop 65. Okay, perfect. So, um, a bit of a summary. I'm going to first go over a bit of summary in Prop 5. So, we're in a new setup, it's always creating a bit of a complication. I'm a bit of summary and then of Prop 65 and then of prosecutions. And then I'm going to talk about how a prosecution defense works at a very high level because that explains pretty well everything on what you need to do. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about exposures. Proposition 65 is about exposure. So I'm going to talk about exposure types, what's in scope, exposure models, and then the testing solution for each model. It's very straightforward things to do. Uh, for each situation, basically each product type. And then I handle some of the really complicated elements of it. There are a huge number of Prop 65 substances. How do you do that in practice? The 800 or 900 substances in scope. Um, and how do you handle substances that don't have a safe harbor limit? Perfect. So, and then I'm going to do at the end a little Q&A. And... There should be quite a bit of Q&A time. This is going to be complicated stuff, so feel free to ask questions in the control panel, um, and I'll get to them as many as possible at the end. Okay, so I mean, a lot, of course, we do a lot of laboratory testing, especially Prop 65. We've tested tens of thousands of products for Prop 65. Uh, we very much know what we're doing. Um, we have some significant advantages over basically anyone else. Partially, it's our screening technology. Um, one of the problems with testing is you test to the nth degree every material for everything. It becomes a geometric effort and cost problem. However, in most cases, you can screen out most of the high-risk substances in very simple methods. It takes a lot of practice and qualification and validation and knowledge, but once you have it, everybody gets the benefit. It's one of the nice things about the volume of testing we do in, in, in our experience and the huge range of products we've seen, there is an easier way to do a lot of things, especially testing. So we focus very much is just a better way. Um, then we can also test for concentration on very, for very specific regions. And then we do exposure testing when it's needed in the most straightforward and effective and defensible way. You're not, we're not trying to like boil the ocean here. We're trying to make sure you can sell your product uh, and it's compliant. And if somebody disagrees, a court case comes along, which is very rare in a product we've tested, but if it does, you have a really good defense. So the other part is we've also done a tremendous amount of defenses. Um, we normally, our testing is to prevent you getting into that situation. But then in a lot of cases, companies haven't used us originally for the testing. We've done data gathering or trusted suppliers or some other silliness around Prop 65. Um, and we end up coming in to defend. So if you're in a situation where you have a Prop 65 notice, we have done tons, dozens and dozens and dozens. There is a whole methodology for it. There's a whole bunch of both chemistry stuff, but there's a whole bunch of also legal rules, especially around the chemistry, which may not be obvious. You may have a, a good experienced lawyer, which really helps on the legal or negotiation point of view, but there's actually a lot of chemistry detail that a lot of people are not aware and how the plaintiff presents their case and what the real defenses are. So we have tremendous experience. So if you're stuck in that situation, contact us. We know what we're doing, but our main work is to prevent you from getting into that situation. The idea is not to have you in, in a prosecution, which is extraordinarily rare um, on any product we've tested. So, one of the things about Prop 65, just an overall summary, is if there's an exposure, and I'll talk about exposures in a minute, above the safe harbor limit for a chemical, the, the product requires an appropriate warning. I'll go into a little more details in a moment. What makes this different is a criminal environmental violation in California can be prosecuted in civil court by a civil plaintiff, which is usually a law firm, often representing, we'll say, some environmental fund in theory, but really a law firm. The law firm does get to claim um, not only penalties, but also costs involved. So there's a lot of motivation there. Because of that, there's around 300 prosecutions a month. It's that kind of, it is by far the most heavily prosecuted restricted materials legislation in the world, roughly 300 a month, over a huge range of consumer and professional uh, products. It's easily the most enforced, you know, 300 ROHS enforcements in a year would be a lot. 
And we do see more and more on the European side, but this is definitely the most heavily enforced at about 300 a month. They're public, um, and that's why we know so much about it. For example, this is kind of a fun one, uh, PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, which gets lots of press these days, movie Dark Waters, Forever Chemical, tons of press. It was added to Prop 65 uh, a couple years back. Um, its prosecutions are fascinating and a bit surprising. Um, the main prosecutions for this year are paper straws. Uh, paper straws are shite at their job. So they really don't hold water. And so to make a paper straw work, you have to add a waterproof coating, which is normally a floral polymer. If you use the wrong additives in the floral polymer, you end up with PFOA. So most of the prosecutions this current year are actually paper straws that have a floral coating. It's kind of funny, people are, want to go to paper straws for environmental reasons, but they have to put a forever chemical in them to make them work at all. So it's kind of neat. Um, the other ones are makeup, um, primarily around an ingredient called C9 to 15 fluoro alcohol phosphate. So if you flip around um, the back of the jar of the makeup, it's one of the potential ingredients. It's basically Teflon. It's a Teflon coating. And that's the reason why it's so silky. And this is often foundation or bronzer or concealer, especially with an SPF. Um, they have a waterproof coating. But the main waterproofing, and the fun part of here, flip around a makeup, especially a face makeup one. And one of the main ingredients right off the bat should be dimethicone. Dimethicone is a code name. Its real name is silicone rubber. So what's on your spatula is the same thing as your concealer or bronzer or, or most makeup. Uh, moisturizer in particular is almost always dimethicone. It's silicone rubber. It's literally most makeup these days is really just a polymer coating. When we talk about war paint, it's kind of funny. Most makeup is really is just a plastic or rubber polymer. Uh, I always, it's always amusing when sometimes people are like condescending, hey, that person has silicone implants or whatever. Silicone's dangerous. You literally smear it all over your face every day. It's silicone rubber. Dimethicone, flip it around, is silicone rubber. Don't believe me, Google dimethicone silicone rubber and you'll get the Wikipedia, which uh, polydimethyl siloxane is its real name, but silicone rubber. And so most cosmetics, by the way, do use an ingredient name that's code word. The, um, the C915 fluoroalkyl phosphate, which is a great code name, is really 8,2 fluorotelomer, which is PFOA uh, functionally. So they do a really good job of, of uh, covering up what the particular material is. So it's kind of neat. So lots of proper, and of course, when I'm talking about this one, this one's public. Now, for most people's products, usually PFOA is less of a concern. It could be in a floral polymer, and we'll explain where that's a risk. You're more likely looking at risks for lead or phthalates or an apolar solvent or bisphenol A or something. Um, but PFOA is one of the ones being prosecuted this year. So, P65 warnings. So if you have an exposure or potential exposure above the safe harbor limit for one of the many Prop 65 chemicals, you either have to remove the chemical, which is a compliance option, reformulation it's called, or you can place the appropriate warning. And this webinar is around the appropriate warnings and the warnings are going through an update. Um, the OEHA, the Calpern organization responsible for the new warnings, didn't meet their timelines for the updated lower warnings. So the next revision of the warnings um, has to go through a whole consultation cycle again, including in-person consultation, very likely. So the new warnings where you have to note the substance, even on the short form warnings, um, probably won't be completed at the end of this year and goes into effect for products manufactured two years later. So we're probably looking at the end of 2024 for the newer warning. However, the current warnings are still in place. Everything we're talking about today is in place. Um, the appropriate warning will change in about two and a half years. Today, you still need the warning if you have an exposure above the props, the appropriate Prop 65 safe harbor limits for that chemical. And there are many, many chemicals. Most regulations we deal with like REACH, SVHC, or REACH restrictions, or ROHS have a PPM concentration limit. People focus on the concentration. This is around exposure, which tends to befuddle the mind on how that all works out. What I'm gonna do today is explain how it actually works out in practice. The 300 prosecutions a month are, from a business perspective, a very strong nuisance, However, they also help put together um, what the actual rules are. So nothing like continuing prosecutions to really help codify a lot of the particular rules. So um, depending on Prop 65 notice, you get a Prop 65 notice, the only thing the plaintiff will care about at all is a test report. If you do not have a test report, um, good luck. 
you might be able to argue down costs based on the vol a small volume of products you place in the market, but the only thing they'll respond to or back down to is a test report. If you really want a technical, and if you argue about test reports, one of the other solutions is you put forward to the plaintiff to agree upon a common methodology and test the same way together. But realistically, they only respond to a test report. They do not respond to supplier data. They know they have a huge amount of experience now. Whatever the supplier said has very little to do often what the product has. And they've seen enough of that. Once they see supplier stuff, like, good one. We've heard that a million times. We have a test report. You do not. At this point, you lose. So the only defense for Prop 65 is to have a test report. Now, if you don't have the substance in the first place, awesome, you'll never get to this situation. But if you do, the only thing they care about is a test report. There's a lot of other technicalities if you want to go down about the one-year uh, limitation of statutory uh, liability and so on and so forth. That's a nice technical. If you ever need defense, we can help you with some of that uh, chemistry legalese stuff. Uh, but for in practice of the many, 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 many defenses I've been part of, uh, they only care about a test report. The plaintiff doesn't really care about any other argument other than possibly your very low volumes and they, you know, they will agree to a lower penalty. That's it. So they don't care about supplier data gathering at all. Not a little bit, not even a tiny bit, zero. Okay, so who's in scope? People are like, wow, it's consumer exposure. It is consumer exposure. There are three different types of exposures in scope. There are consumer exposures, which is uh, usually a private citizen or a patient, a, a patient at a hospital or other sort of thing is, would be under consumer exposure. Occupational exposure is also in scope. So this could be an employee, it could be an installer, it could be a repair technician, it could be the healthcare practitioner. Their occupational exposure is also in scope. The rules are a little more open-ended with occupational for warning purposes because you can make more assumptions on the education of the, the, the person and the fact they should read the instructions. Consumers, you can't normally assume they're gonna read instructions. It's normally not sufficient. So there is more leeway on how the warning is provided for occupational exposures, but it still needs to be provided in a situation of exposure. And there's also environmental exposure, which is everything else. Primarily, it's like stuff that goes into the drain, you know, like a car wash is under environmental exposure. You know, a factory's effluent is environmental exposure. It's not really an occupational exposure. It's not really a consumer exposure. It's an environmental exposure. It's like a liquid or a gas or powder that gets out into the environment. All three are in scope. So Prop 65 includes all three. A lot of the specificity about the warnings around consumer, because consumers have a lot more, far more specific requirements, because you cannot assume a consumer reads instructions, which is kind of funny. Um, but occupational is compliant if it follows the consumer rules, or but it does have some leadway um, on assuming they'll read instructions and can place warnings in different locations of slightly different types if they so choose, but they'd have to justify. If they use the consumer warning uh, approach, they'll be fine. So there are also models of exposure. There are really four main ones. There's ingestion, inhalation, dermal, and invasive. So basically, you know, a device that goes through your skin. Yes, there's a fifth one. Um, there's also rectal exposure. Uh, we're not really gonna discuss that one today. That's for the late night version of this webinar. We'll get to that another time. So this is what we're gonna talk about ingestion, inhalation, dermal, and invasive, the main ones. Yeah. Ingestion is actually the number one uh, prosecution for physical products and for food, but for physical products. But before that, note, um, if you do a concentration test and you get a non-detect for a substance and it's a reasonable test, not some inappropriate test, you're off got free anyways. So if you get non-detect in a concentration, you do not, and it's a reasonable test, you don't have to worry about exposure. It's one of the rules. It's deep in Prop 65, down in the basement, in a drawer and room mark, beware of the panther. It's, uh, there's a comment saying a test report of non-detect on a reasonable test is an accurate defense and you don't need to do exposure. But if you're above non-detect, you have to look at exposure. And it doesn't mean you necessarily have to do an exposure test. You either have to do an exposure test or place a warning, or you have like ourselves, a lot of historical data so we know where the concentrations would lie relative to uh, exposure. Certain levels for certain substances are no chance at all of having exposure other levels uh, because of their concentrations and the migration of that particular material have a much higher exposure type. 
So one of the materials that has a really high exposure is a phthalates in PVC. One, because of their tremendous concentration, they can be up to you know, 20 to 30% of the weight of the PVC. But PVC, flexible PVC is not exactly what you think of it as. Flexible PVC is very much like your sponge in your kitchen. So when you get your dry sponge, you, 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 know, you haven't done dishes in a while, which would be probably my fault. Um, you have this sponge and you take it out and it's hard because it's dry, you can't bend it. It's relatively light though. Um, that's normal PVC. So phthalates are like adding water to it. So phthalates, it's actually a liquid. Uh, even though you might look at your power cable and say, hey, it's a solid, the phthalates in it are actually a liquid. So you fill up the sponge with water and suddenly your sponge, it, it swells. So same thing with when phthalates are added to PVCs, it swells. What phthalates do is they push the vinyl chloride strands, PVC is polyvinyl chloride, farther apart. By pushing them farther apart, it's like pushing two magnets farther apart, it reduces the bonds of attraction and makes it more flexible. So it's like putting water in a sponge, it swells and becomes flexible. Same thing with phthalates, you add them to PVC, it causes it to swell and become more flexible. The problem is it's really a liquid and it comes out really easily to the point where even in water and phthalates don't come out in water in practice for beans, uh, phthalates are non-polar and water's polar, they don't like each other. But if you put in a method that shakes it, phthalates come out of it because they're not bound to anything. Actually, one of the most common low-level ROHS phthalate uh, non-compliance we get is because somebody ran wires through some kind of machine, um, a crimping machine or something like that, that had a lot of phthalates in it. Then they ran a phthalate-free one through it and ended up picking it up because the phthalates are like a liquid. They smear all the equipment. I remember when ROHS first came in, everybody's worried about lead contamination for different soldering iron tips. And we did see a tiny bit of that. It's much worse for phthalates because phthalates literally smear PVC with phthalates and it smear every piece of equipment they touch. Phthalates are fundamentally liquid. So different ones have different exposure rates and you really need a history and how that all works. Again, if you're non-detect for a concentration, you're off got free. If um, you're above non-detect, you either have to do an exposure or place a warning, or you have really good historical data to not worry about the exposure at that particular concentration. There are also quite a few settlements for a lot of the main substances, lead and phthalates, which also provide you with some concentration limits that you shouldn't really be worried about. By the way, again, if you have questions, I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions in this one, uh, feel free to submit them in the control panel. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Just checking, uh, I have some commentary in the background by people observing, so I just wanna make sure, okay, good. They are a bit distracting when they're saying a variety of things. I was worried that, you know, suddenly I can't see your head or I can't understand you or no, no, you're stupid. That would be my family. Um, so ingestion model. Uh, physical products, the main, believe it or not, the main exposure, prosecution exposure model is ingestion. It's like, well, I make a router. What's, I don't know if he's going to put that router in my mouth. Yeah, that's not the exposure model. The exposure models is related. It's the same exposure model as the main COVID exposure model. It's hand to mouth ingestion. It's physically touching something, having it come off in your hands, and then through the act of eating or smoking or just fidgeting, you touch your mouth. In Prop 65 rules, the average American touches their mouth eight times pre COVID uh, between hand washing. Because of that, the rule is, and the math is, 50% of when it's on your fingertips gets ingested, which we lead or phthalates. Of course, in the virus side, which I do a lot of the viral exposure stuff, it could be COVID or hand, foot, and mouth, et cetera, 50% um, of what gets on your fingertips is from a, when we do a defense or a legal point of view, is assumed to be ingested. So it's casual contacting, touch, what comes off in your fingers, 50% of it's assumed to be ingested. I know everybody are going home going, stomachs are probably ro rolling a bit. It's true, that's actually the main thing. The, the first touching gets off about 25% of it and each one takes a little bit less. And it ends up being about 50% of what's on your fingertips gets ingested. Um, because of poor hand washing. So that's the rule. So the test for it is very simple, it's a white test. It's basically a little wet wipe and there's a methodology around it. You wipe the surface and whatever comes up in the wet wipe simulates your hand. And then 50% of what comes off is what you would have ingested. So it makes it really easy. That many milligrams divided by two, that's 50%, is really your daily exposure rate. So it's a really straightforward white test, um, very easy to do. However, some people do it completely wrong. The basic wipe test is really for lead. It's, it's an NIOSH test, it's, it's EPA. Um, and lead or artificial sweat, which is water, sorry, or artificial sweat, which are pretty darn similar actually, artificial 
sweat it's just slightly acidic water the basic version one would buy um, it's really good for metals so metals are polar um, like likes like chemist chemists uh, chemicals are bigots like likes like so polar likes polar so water which is basically like an acid and metals which are also polar um, tend to be far more reactive so a water wipe test is really good for the standard lead or cadmium and other polar substances it's absolutely it's ridiculously poor for organics organics don't dissolve in water like if you went home and you took your table salt and you threw it in water it will dissolve you take vegetable oil from home threw your table salt in it it'll just sit there oils are non-polar most organics phthalates bisphenol a are non-polar um, water isn't the right mechanism now if the exposure was only only water then yes it is like if if the only thing it touched was water great but your hands your sweat contains two different groupings it contains a very slightly acidic water it's your main sweat and sebum oil so it's the oil from your sebaceous glands often when you leave fingerprints on things that's the oil from your, your sebaceous glands if it get blocked that's what creates zits that's the the oil there so we add about six percent sebum it's a combination of a variety of different oils but it's basically simulate hand oil and use that for the white test and it produces a dramatic difference for the organics and it's much more applicable to what you'd actually be touching it's there there's basically you can get it we often make it ourselves but basically the artificial perspiration with sebum um, it's about six percent sebum it's what we use for white test on the bright side most of the plaintiffs don't know about this yet um, but it's much more effective at getting a result now it will get a higher result but it's a much more accurate result. For phthalates, it, it's a very, very different. You put phthalate in PVC in water, not a lot happens unless you violently shake it, and then it kind of comes out like water out of a sponge because phthalates do not dissolve in water. They're the wrong types of materials, but they do dissolve in sebum, which is, think of it as sort of higher end vegetable oil, and it comes out in that. And so it's one of the reasons when you do food contact testing in Europe, when you're doing, uh, a product or material that can touch milk you're using a fatty type simulant because there are certain materials that come out in fats because they're also non-polar or in their other materials like the metals that come out in water or acids because they're very polar so the appropriate test if you do a white test for the metals is basically water you can use artificial perspiration but it's basically the same for all intents and purposes um, phs are so close together um, but for organics, ones that are non-polar, you really should be using sebum. Now, it's still about 94% water, so you still have the polar aspect. So you'll get um, either situation. If you don't know what the organic is, polar or non-polar, um, or it's a surfactant like PFOA, um, the sebum version has both. It's only 6% oil, 94% water. Um, by the way, a lot of times, don't use ethanol. A lot of, uh, especially medical companies, use 40% ethanol in water for extraction. It's a really bad idea. Um, ethanol is an estifier and people are like oh, I, I, didn't, I don't know what that means so what it does is ethanol has the ability to modify esters and you're like oh well phthalates are an ester if you look at phthalate it's got this you know benzene type ring and these two long ridiculous arms off it and they have these little oxygens midway down the arm and that's an ester uh, ethanol um, est re-esterifies things. It turns into Frankenstein's monster. It'll literally pull one arm off the DHP and put it on somewhere else and reattach it. Um, it literally plays Mr. Potato Head with, with phthalates. So often I see like a lot of medical test reports that use ethanol, often they might get some, especially the higher temperature, which makes it worse. Um, they'll get some DHP, there's DHP in there, and they got a whole bunch of stuff that kind of looks like DHP if you drop Mr. Potato Head on the ground and try to put it back together uh not normally the best idea and if your skin oil is 40 percent alcohol you have a problem phone 911. uh the other ones often used is n-hexane a very powerful polar solvent way too powerful it will actually depolymerize plastics so if you put in an abs you suddenly get styrene because abs is acrylonitrile butadiene styrene and you suddenly have a prop 65 issue because you're dissolving the abs same thing if you put it on acrylics like plexiglass or PMMA, you'll start to get the acrylates coming out, which are also Prop 65. It's because it's not because it's extracting it, it's literally dissolving the plastic. So often when I see those ones used, it's like you made a laptop and you wanted to give the laptop to somebody and say, hey, can you just check and test to see if there's any sharp edges? So I'm worried about sharp edges in my laptop. And then somebody takes the laptop, puts it on a table and looks at it and then reaches back and grabs a huge mallet and smashes it and then says you a whole bunch of sharp edges. And you're like, well, which ones? And they can't really describe it because little bits and pieces of things. 
So often when I look at the test reports for N-hexane, I see the same thing. They're kind of like alkenes. Yeah, you took the plastic, which are made up of alkenes, and you dissolved it, and you got a bunch of other things left over. It is literally like the laptop. You took a mallet to it and smashed it. And yes, there are sharp edges now, and a whole bunch of pieces you can't really describe. Don't do that. Um, also, if your skin was N-hexane, there would be a variety of problems ongoing. So the one we normally use is usually the straightforward standard artificial perspiration with 6% sebum. That gives you the non-polar element without, you know, the big mallet version. Um, we don't really need the Bugs Bunny Acme Roadrunner approach to testing. That would be cool. Not a good idea. So that's, that is the main casual contact. Most prosecutions around the casual contact. Hand contact and 50% of what is on your hands gets ingested. And you have to use the right wipe test because some things, metals come out of water or acids and organics generally come out in oils. Um, inhalation testing is for powders. It's not for testing a power cable. You're not really worried, I hope, with somebody snorting up your power cable. Um, this is around powders or extremely volatile organic compounds like you get coming out of a new um, plywood. Uh, this isn't for stuff embedded. This is inhalation. Now, inhalation, Prop 65 substances, there is a disproportionate number of Prop 65 substances that are only inhalable issues. A titanium dioxide, I'll explain in a second, is one of those. And I'll explain the, the huge discrepancy around that. So Prop 65 inhalations you normally use for powders, like foot powder, baby powder, aerosol sunscreen. Those are all inhalation risks. And that's where you do this kind of test. And it's generally pretty low risk for physical products. I'm not really worried about inhalation problems from your router, your mouse, you know, your endoscope, your medical device, that kind of thing. Um, we're worried more about powders. You make, you know, foot powder or baby powder or some kind of aerosol sunscreen. That's inhalation. So for most products, inhalation really isn't much of an issue. Um, but what's also a huge discrepancy people don't understand is a disproportionate number of the prop 65 substances your supplier reports are inhalation only and they're reporting them correctly but you're not understanding so good example is titanium dioxide titanium dioxide is what makes plastic white that's what it is it's, it is a prop 65 carcinogen if inhaled so the bag of pellets which the safety data sheets for has dust and it's an inhalation risk for the molder. Again, occupational exposure is in scope. So the SDS does have an offer a Prop 65 warning for the pellets because they're inhalation, they're powder, they're flakes, that kind of thing. But once you make it into your white tube, inhalation is not a problem anymore. So titanium dioxide is not a Prop 65 substance. Prop 65, uh, sorry, titanium dioxide, carbon black, uh, silica, antimony trioxide, they're all inhalation only. So if instead of powder, absolutely, those are really good warnings, especially when you don't know how much you know, plastic, dust, or powder somebody's gonna inhale. But your tube, at the end of the day, or your wire, or a cable, are not inhalable, and they're not a Prop 65 exposure risk. They're inhalation only, the respirable particles. So this is the big difference between often what your supplier reports to you and what's applicable to your product, because the safety data sheet will often correctly say titanium dioxide's a Prop 65 risk, because it's not for your product, it's for the bag of pellets that somebody's gonna use, or flakes, or powder, they're gonna use to make your product. So inhalation testing, um, so again, if you have no concentration of it, you don't have to do an inhalation test. If you're worried about you know, some substance like titanium dioxide, you don't have titanium, not a problem. Uh, but it's really for powders. So if you install powders, it's generally a, an OSHA a monitor test. It's basically a respirable particle or particle impact uh, monitor and a typical airborne uh, dust or powder test. Uh, for respirable particles or for titanium or whatever you're looking for from the powder. Where we often see in the physical products we do the test is if you have an air filter in like an air conditioner or something like that, where you're blowing air through it, then you're worried about the titanium dioxide that makes the filter white or the silica from getting out. Um, we do that particular test, but that's really just an inhalation situation. Now for like plywood and stuff, which generally is already governed by I think Title VI or other VOC requirements, that's a, your typical VOC um, so headspace GCMS. We don't do as much of that um, in this particular case. It's usually because most VOC containing products of other legislation that already test and monitor VOCs and gives them all the data they need. Common high risk physical products, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, obviously things that you suck in air through, it's mostly the filters, air conditioners, humidifiers, and then of course, you know, separately powders. If you're you know selling powders, that kind of thing where you could have 
inhalable titanium dioxide or similar, we look at that. Now, most of the time we do testing, it's around the unclear situation. Because if you have titanium dioxide and foot powder, you're kind of in. And we can do the test, but it's pretty obvious um, that you have inhalable titanium dioxide. It's more we do the inhalation testing for filters, for personal protective equipment, humidifiers, air conditioners. We're pulling air through a fibrous material that has titanium dioxide or silica. Um, and you just really want to make sure that you don't have an exposure. You generally don't. Most good filters don't, but often you have to check. It's not something you're going to be wrong about. Um, the third one is dermal testing. So this is prolonged human contact. This is absorption to the skin. This is not ingestion. Um, this is not inhalation. This is absorption to the skin. And your skin generally is a pretty good barrier for most things. Um, nickel being one of the main ones here. And nickel is an interesting substance. It turns out nobody's allergic to nickel. And you probably have friends, yourself saying, wait a minute, I'm quite allergic to nickel. Don't worry, I can show you what happens. What actually happens in reality is the nickel metal is soluble in sweat. Again, it's non-polar. It, uh, sorry, it's polar, it's a metal, and it dissolves in your sweat, which is quite polar. And they end up with nickel 2 plus. Nickel 2 plus will chop up your skin and then react with your skin proteins and create a nickel protein hybrid, which is what people are allergic to. But the damage is really done by the nickel 2 plus. That's why also, if you look at the, the cancer listing, say in, in Europe, all the water soluble nickel salts are carcinogens because nickel 2 plus, the dissolved form, is a carcinogen. It does damage to you. Uh, most dissolved metals, by the way, do one damage or another to you. Um, so this is really looking at repeat or, or prolonged human contact, so wearables. So if you have a situation where you have nickel or some other material in prolonged human contact, uh, that's the dermal testing. So whether it's a wearable, um, like a watch, or prolonged repeat, like a video game controller, that's prolonged repeat. Your squash racket is not wearable, but it's equivalent. It's prolonged repeat exposure. And so you're looking at dermal exposure, which is a different mechanism. It's a different test. It's not a simple wipe. Wipe is not a bad test for it, but it's not quite the right test. Handles for tool cases, et cetera, one you can hold for a period of time are dermal. It's a different type of exposure. Um, normally, we use the European test, EN 1811, or similar. There's ones that's got coating protections that rough it up a little bit. Um, it's one of the best ones for it. Uh, for metals, we use artificial sweat, like the standard EN 1811. If it's an organic, we have to add the sebum again, because uh, organics like phthalates are not soluble in water. They're only really soluble in organics. So we have to add the sweat oil from your sebaceous gland. If you look at your hand and you look down your hair follicles and you see it's like little pores, that's what's coming out of the pores. It's the sebum. It's the oil from the sebaceous gland. Again, don't use alcohol or ethanol, uh, N-hexane. They're absolutely too aggressive and they will change the chemistry. You'll get new chemicals they weren't expecting in originally. Uh, ethanol can take phthalates and make it into a whole new Frankenstein, Mr. Potato Head phthalates. And N-hexane is like taking your product and smashing it with a mallet and trying to make sense of the bits. Yes, you'll have a lot of bits. I agree, that's not the point. So next question, a lot of people ask, well, there's like 900 plus substances on the list. Yes. More or less oversimplification, every category one known to cause or category two likely causes a cancer or reproductive harm or developmental toxicity is on the list, which is a lot of substances. It's not hard to get on. And that's hundreds and hundreds. However, there really are only are about a dozen to really extending at 20 to worry about any normal situation. And they almost all have a lot of history down. There are a lot of really good screening tests where we we can take a complicated product with you know, thousands of parts. And again, we're also looking at exposures. We're looking at accessible outside external parts and test through it with a screening method that can pretty well yay nay it pretty quickly. And the ones that say, hey, you know what? This one may have it because most time it's really this one can't have it. It does not have this material or this situation. It doesn't have lead or so on and so forth. Um, there's a more specific concentration test. So, for example, in, in a PVC, we can say, hey, it has an orthothalate. We have to then do a concentration test. When during screening, we know it has an orthothalate, and we have to use a concentration test, GCMS, to tell you what concentration of which orthothalate, and which actually has a big impact because the different phthalates have different exposure limits. Um, and then we can do exposure tests if it comes down to it. If it's not clear cut above or beyond based on its concentration, it's really straightforward to wipe tests or the dermal tests, or in the rare situation needed, inhalation test. Now, the invasive test, which I didn't bring here for medical, normally they have their own test already done with values. Pretty well, any Prop 65 substance is already 
more or less in the 10993-18 testing for invasive devices. And you likely will be able to make sense from that. Now, I can't say that dash 18 medical testing is done well in a lot of cases, but um, any of the substance of interest will already be there, hopefully in an applicable situation. But if you use ethanol or N-hexane for the situation, you're going to have some fun. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit exciting. You either have the Mr. Potato Head situation or you have the smashed laptop situation. It's like, for example, if you do your typical medical testing on an acrylic, you'll get acrylates if you use n because it's going to dissolve the acrylic. And the acrylics are not, um, the, the, they don't, not resistant to n -hexane. They will literally dissolve it, not super fast, but the polymethyl methacrylate will be dissolved in a methyl acrylate, which is both a concern for the medical side and for Prop 65. But it's not really there. It's not like you're extracting it. You're literally dissolving. You're throwing a bunch of chemicals in there and dissolving it. It's like, don't do that. Um, a lot of people say, hey, this is the most aggressive situation. It's really aggressive. Taking a mallet to a laptop is aggressive, but not really the way the laptop should be used. Um, now, I have a new puppy, and he thinks a lot of things should be used by biting and chewing, no matter what it is, but that's really not what we're all trying to encourage. The other problem is, um, so again, screening, using a lab that knows what they're doing. We've done so much of this. We've done this for the longest time know exactly what we're doing. Plus, we also defend cases, so we have a huge insight on reality. Um, but safe harbor limits. So people are like, well, the exposure limits of micrograms per day are there for DHP, uh, but they're not there for the protocol or solvent DMAC, which I have for my product. Um, they're all calculable. They're all really straightforward. They might say, hey, this is a really complicated cal calculation. It is. It is very technical. It's not as hard as validating the actual test. So if somebody can actually validate a test for the, the substance, it's not harder to do the calculation, may or may not be the same person, but it also, if the lab is doing the calculation for the first time for you, squint at them a little bit, because this shouldn't be the first time they've run into this substance. So that, I mean, rarely I can think of a situation for us recently. It's very rare they're gonna run into a situation they haven't seen this chemical a gazillion times for Prop 65 and don't already have the base calculations. If they don't say, hey, we gotta charge you for these calculations, and like, a, I don't want to pay a lot more money for you to do a crappier job. Um, use somebody who does this all the time. It's, it's a common thing. They should have it on hand. Some of them are well-known. A lot of them are actually already, even though they're not on the Prop 65 website or officially published, there are scientific papers that already published it for Prop 65. They're just not adopted yet. Um, by the way, you can do the calculations. You normally do it for, if you want to do it yourself or have somebody like us do it, which you normally do from no observable uh, effect limits or no observable adverse effect limits. Uh, N-O-E-L or N-O-A-E-L. You basically use a formula to translate it. It's a particular Prop 65 document. It's on page 22. Um, it explains the calculation. Um, you basically take the N-O-E-L or similar, uh, which is really in milligrams usually per kilogram body weight. So if it's 70 kilogram person, which is normal for Prop 65, you have to add a 70 in there per day. And then unlike medical, Prop 65 then divides it by a thousand. So it, one of the biggest differences, say, between medical testing, the safety risk limit is 100. So whatever the no observable you know, effect limit is, they divide by 100 and that's the safety limit for medical devices. Proposition 65 divides it by 1,000. It's a little bit different, but it's right in there. It's relatively straightforward to do. Um, you could always argue on which published NOEL or other you should use, um, but as long as you use a reasonable one, you would be fine. Now, realistically, if you're very close to the limit to begin with, you probably want to put the warning because one test or another might produce a slightly different result. Uh, but it's pretty common. So my, people might go, well, there's no safe harbor limit for this. I'm like, yeah, but it's a whole process for it. It just involves somebody who knows what they're doing. I mean, I can't, I, if I had to lay out a circuit board, I would be hopeless, beyond hopeless. Uh, but this sort of thing, not a problem. So it's different levels of specialty. I like this kind of math. It doesn't necessarily make me invited to a lot of dinners and places. I'm like, oh, let's talk about the exposure limit on this fork. People are like, I, I, I'm just liking food, man. I'm like, oh, sorry, it's hard. Uh, anyways, so we do tons of lab testing. Uh, we kind of enjoy it. I enjoy it. I'm a little bit different. It's fun. Uh, my kids are properly embarrassed by me, which is awesome. That's the way it should be. So the laboratory testing, uh, we've done this for thousands of products. Like everybody says, is what we really do. This is something we enjoy doing, we're fun doing, um, but we're really good at it. And the nice thing is we do it all the time. So we've worked a lot of the bugs out, the kinks out. A miscellaneous category in any of these sort of things is a big thing. And we've dealt with the miscellaneous category. We're really good at this. So just come to us again. The defense only cares if you have a test report. 
He was like, well, he's Tesla. I'll be saying that. I'm like, no, I've, I've defended so many cases. They only care if they have a test report. They have a test report you because they'll always have a test report. They have one and you don't. You're covered. They're like, yeah, you can sit there and talk to you all the time, but I have a test report and you don't. So money. Um, so Prophecy 5 defense is, if you don't have an appropriate warning, is really only by test report. Um, it's relatively straightforward for us to do, and we can normally do it while we do reach SVHC or ROHS or the PFOA stuff or whatever fun acronym of the day um, you need done. We're really good at that stuff too. The nice thing is a lot of substances overlap, and it really is just a process variation to handle each. And as long as you're organized and do it up front, it all comes out in an efficient and less costly way. Again, being organized is a good thing. Um, so on to Q&A, and we'll have to see if we can put my the, the question control panel up on the screen. That would be awesome. And I have some wonderful people helping me. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have the other Bruce, we'll just call him Evil Bruce for this moment, helping me. He's doing a great job. That made him laugh. I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, so we can probably minimize that one or whatever. That's it. Perfect. Leave it up. That's awesome. And just bring over the other one. No, leave it the way it is. I don't. Uh, it, trying to find the chat. It's okay. So no problem. Um, it has people's names on it. So maybe not. Um, actually, if you just read out the questions to me, that would be first and just open up the name. And if you put the slide back up, that would be awesome. There we go. Slide right up. Perfect. Yeah, so new setup here. So I'm on camera and I've been on camera a couple of times, but again, it's, it's a newer a newer setup here. And I keep walking in front. It's kind of different because I see myself in reverse where Cleggan's put. Um, it's under uh, questions. It's in the, it's about three below where the volume stuff is. Perfect. So uh, one of the first questions is, um, my supplier said, I have nickel. I said nickel in my steel, but I would place a warning. So first of all, there is in the same locked cabinet in the basement, uh, you know, Mark Beware of the Panther, there is a comment in a, one of the documents in Prophecy 5 in the legislation that says nickel is not an ingestion rate risk, nickel metal. So you're only looking at dermal or inhalation, but really dermal. So you're looking at prolonged human contact. So nickel, which could be in you know, a variety of your metals, is only an issue if in prolonged human contact. And there's a whole test process. You just use the, the European EN 1811. Um, but nickel in steel is not normally a Prop 65 substance unless it's a powder form because you're inhaling it or it's wearable. Inside your steel of your product, casual touching, there is a section of Prop 65 that says nickel is not an ingestion risk. Therefore, casual contact is not a risk. We have a question. Okay, go ahead. Are you able to justify not labeling if you can show that contact nature will be transient or very limited? So if there's casual contact, as uh, the white test. If it's internal and there's no contact, then normally the user wouldn't need it. You may need one for repair technician, depending on your product, et cetera, but that can go, because there are occupational exposure, that can usually go in the repair manual or similar and not be with the product normally. So if there is no exposure, then there's no risk. Casual contact, if you basically take a wipe and it comes off, that's enough. So basically casual contact is in, even though it's transient, um, if it's not intended or internal, then no, there wouldn't normally be an exposure. If your product is an electronic device, are we only worried about what the customer touches or all the internal parts as well? Great question. Very similar. Again, it's only with exposure. So the normal user outside. So the warning that go with the product or on the product packaging or however you provide it is related to the external components. If, for example, you made a washing machine, and the washing machine has a, your repair technicians open it up, and the real problem is the fan belt in there, which the, the user shouldn't touch, but the repair technician could. Then that could go in the repair technician manual. It wouldn't have to go with the product. Um, so it is related to the exposure. So the consumer has to be exposed, and physical uh, has to be warned before exposure. Unless it's an internet sale, then they have to be warned before checkout. Uh, an occupational exposure can be uh, warned in a more work appropriate manner. Is there a risk for parts that are seldom touched by users, but may be briefly and repeatedly touched on multiple units by installers? Yes, and again, the same thing with well, wonderfully good question. So the installer may require warning, and because they're in scope, but the warning would be primarily around the repair. And this also often goes for repair parts that would normally be for installers instead of normal users. The repair parts and the repair manuals could have the warning. However, if the repair part had its own warning, that would be fine too. And a lot of people's uh, professional products, like so for example, when they go after a refrigerator, 
They almost don't ever go out to the refrigerator. It's too expensive. They don't want to buy, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollar uh, refrigerator to find out if they have an issue. They want to buy the replacement water hose, or the PVC hose with the little leaded brass ends. That's what they want. So it is often the replacement parts that are higher risk, um, external, that kind of thing, uh, especially if they are purchasable and used by the end consumer. You mentioned low volumes as a defense. Can you clarify that volume threshold? <laughs> low volume is just how much they will ding you for. So basically say, hey, I've got you. I've got this test report. And you're like, well, either you don't have an ability to test, don't have a test report, or they you know they have you. You often said, well, we sold six in California. So you'd use that as an argument. By the way, when you're in the defense, unless you have a clear cut test report, it is a negotiation process. A lot of the lawyers do it really good at it. And they're really good at saying, hey, you started here, we're saying here, and negotiate an outcome. Low volumes make it so you can normally negotiate a lower dollar figure, but it's a negotiation element. It doesn't have a specific threshold, you know, minimum. It's related to if you have very few devices, it's a lot easier to say, hey, it's, it's only this many devices. Let's settle for a much lower dollar figure. It doesn't get you off the hook. It just can reduce your bill. How are compounds such as ABS resins viewed under Prop 65? ABS is not listed, whereas individual components of the resin are listed. Acrylonitrile, butadiene, and styrene. That's really good. It's really knowledgeable. So almost all polymers, plastics, their ingredients to make them are almost always Prop 65 substances. I mean, they're reactive, and that's how you put them together. Um, so ABS plastic is acrylonitrile, uh, butadiene, styrene. And acrylonitrile and 1,3-butadiene and styrene are individually Prop 65 substances, but not the polymer. So it's only the residual styrene that's an issue. And in general, the styrene and ABS will be a very low level. And we're still looking at the normal exposure, you know, wipe or, or if it's prolonged human contact, you know, one of the dermal tests. Um, it'll be a little bit higher in ABS uh, polycarbonate blends. There's a reason for that, that the styrene and the bisphenol A. So polycarbonate is really a repeating chain of uh, bisphenol A and phosgene over and over again, but it's polycarbonate at the end. There will be a tiny bit of residual BPA, higher in ABS polycarbonate blends for some reason, um, but it's the residual non-reacted monomer that's the issue. And generally it's very low concentration. So anything related to white test should have a ridiculously low styrene for ABS or, or um, bisphenol A for polycarbonate or a methyl acrylate for plexiglass. And it's really the residual monomer, which should be quite small. What do you define as prolonged contact for dermal testing? Is that based off ISO 10993? Um, it's close enough. So the medical side, normally we use the, the more consumer side. We we'll often use the European one, um, but if it's close enough, we put it in. So the European one around pH is pretty good, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. It's it's repeat. Generally, it's um, it's how many times it's touched in 10 minutes or 30 minutes. I can't remember the exact number. It's usually pretty clear cut one way or another. We're really looking at wearables and handles as opposed to just casual contact. So it has to be something closer to a handle, a video game controller. I can't remember the number of contacts. I'm kind of you know kicking myself right now. I normally go off the top of my head. Um, it is, but it's basically um, prolonged human contact for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, generally, you're just looking at something which you, you use over and over again. So you're looking at handles, repeat buttons. So not the buttons, you just say go. I mean, and it's video game controller buttons, that kind of thing. Perfect. Does Clagan test the products for risk of exposure considering the environmental conditions the product is meant to be used? Uh, we would take all the appropriate steps that's appropriate to it. So normally off the bat, screen to see if there's any of the substances we even care about or likely there, and there might be a handful that could be there or have a situation, there's a material there that um, has, there's a, it's a very complicated process, has an element or an organic that indicates it is there or could be there. And then we do a more concentrated follow-up concentration test that tells us if it's exactly there and, and how much concentration. Then if we do an exposure, it's based on the use of that product. Um, in general, the wipe tests are pretty straightforward. Um, there are some obscure situations, like we've done things like urinary bags and stuff like that, which it's a slightly different situation. And we've done very, very, you know, specific um, situations. But in general, most of the time, believe it or not, everybody thinks they're all special. And you guys are all special. Um, 
but a lot of times if other people have already tread the same path you're walking, it's using a process or a method or a whole solution set that's already developed and used. Can a justification be used if the normal use of the impacted item is in an operating room and only touched with gloved hands? So that's an interesting question. So when we communicate a lot of times, say, say some handpiece uh, for medical device, and it's the handle, and the handle's not patient contact because you're not worried about that exposure. It's only healthcare practitioner. So we will identify that you have to address this issue. Um, in terms of exposure, if we're looking at hand contact only and they're wearing a glove and they have proper protective equipment, as long as your instructions indicate that or it can be clearly assumed. Clearly assumed you have to be a little bit careful about because the plaintiffs are going to go, how do you know they have to wear gloves? Where is it written down? And it's not written down. You can still justify it, but it's more argumentative. It's written down, say, in the use instructions, you have to use gloves or proper protective equipment. Um, then it's pretty straightforward. There is no you know, hand contact, ingestion, exposure. It's not a reasonable um, situation. So it's easier if it's written down. Um, it can be justified, but it's much more argumentative, just so people know. Um, again, uh, if, if it's not clear cut, the plaintiff doesn't want to back down. They want their, their money. So um, the argument is tougher. You have to go more to the wall on that one. Cool. How about nickel containing stainless steel? Repeated exposure daily with casual contact, unless there is a teenager that hangs on a refrigerator door. <laughs> so, uh, casual contact, white test uh, is ingestion. Uh, nickel is not a Prop 65 substance for ingestion. It's deep in like a 13 year old section of Prop 65. It's pretty funny. So, you're only looking at wearables. And if it's wearables, it's, it's, uh, it's a straightforward EN 1811 test. Stainless steel should pass with flying colors. Um, stainless steel shouldn't have nickel coming out of it. So when in doubt, it's a, because that test is so commonplace, it's not an expensive test whatsoever. I mean, everything that's wearable, every watch, everything has that test. So um, it's a relatively inexpensive test. If you think it's prolonged human contact, um, you know, refrigerator doors, bit complicated question, but it's not a casual contact issue just for nickel. Nickel happens to be a, a not an in, props to five substance for ingestion, only dermal and inhalation. Cool. You mentioned the only thing that is dependable is a test report. Is there any lab accreditation or minimum requirement requirements that are needed or will help in the courts? So normally a 17025 accreditation is helpful, but normally we don't get to that argument. Normally what ends up happening is they have a test report, you have a test report, and if they don't back down, which will happen about 15% of the time, because they believe there's something wrong with yours, what you normally do is then, okay, we're going to sit there and argue around the room all day. We're going to make it simple. Let's agree on test method between the two of us and then go out and have a lab's test for it and compare. And always the plaintiff backs down at that point in time. So 17025 is really good, um, but we've never run into a situation where it's really argued. We are, and you know, I'd like to promote it, but it, we've never run into that situation uh, about the accreditation. Um, we, if there is an argument about they have a test report and you have a test report and you're getting different answers, and there's a couple situations recently what that is. Um, super complicated. Some of the Prop 65 substances are actually mixtures of a family of substances, and it's a good question whether one of the individual substances not in the mixture is actually a Prop 65 substance. So there are some complicating factors like that in test reports, um, sort of chemistry legal. Uh, but when we come down to, to brass tacks, and we're getting two different results, um, normally the process and the, the plaintiff knows they have no leg to stand on if they turn it down saying, hey, we disagree, let's agree on a method and go get it tested separately and compare. And that's virtually always when they back down. Um, they know they're, they're, we're, they're used to working with uh, companies that don't have the know-how uh, behind this and they realize you're too much effort. And they know the courts, if they back, if they don't do a reasonable test to correlate the two, they're, they're not gonna win. And so if, if basically the defendant says, hey, you got this result, I got this result, Let's agree on a test method and redo the test because we're probably just agreeing, disagreeing on methods. Um, they usually back down at that point. Cool. The Prop 65 substances in metal alloys will have any risk of exposure, like in copper alloys. Lead. Lead comes out of copper like nobody's business. Cadmium does come out of it. For cadmium has a much higher threshold than lead, so it is a problem. It does come out, but it's not so bad. It's funny, lead comes out of two things a lot. A brass comes out a lot. There's a lot of brass prosecutions. It's really common. The other one is lead comes out of ceramic. Um, so if you have a food dish, like a ceramic food dish, there's a reason why the inside is white, which is titanium dioxide, 
and the outside has got the color, and the color is not normally on the inside because the kiln will destroy most organic colorants, so it has to be in metal and red or yellow is cadmium, blue or green is lead. And believe it or not, that ceramic dish, you wipe it, that lead comes right out of the blue or green, no problem. But technically, because it's on the outside surface, it's not food contacting and allowed. That's why the white is, the inside is white and the outside is colored. Um, the cadmium will be cadmium selenium, the lead will be a variety of different types of compounds, so basically leaded. Um, because you need a metal. Um, if you have a ceramic, the organic, you know, whatever is not gonna make it in the kiln, it's gonna be a metal to create that color. Does non-detect mean what it implies? You can't detect it, or does it mean it might be there but below the quantifiable limit? It's a good question. So it's the detection limit, which you, you can always argue is quantification limit, either one, um, for a reasonable test. If the test is not reasonable, different story, but it has to be basically a reasonable and applicable test. A prophecy five generally doesn't ha have its own test, so it, it pretty well accepts anyone else's US or European. A disproportionate number of the tests are actually European because they have the more regular substance tests. Um, but if you've got a non-detect to a reasonable test, then you're fine. Normally we don't get anything between, the, whether it's detection limit or quantification limit, we've never actually run into that being a problem. And generally for most substances, if it's at that level anyways, we have lots of historical data says, you know, 0.1 ppm for that substance is a non-issue. And when in doubt, if you really want to argue, we can do a white test and we're going to we'll get a non-detect on that white test for that substance at 0.1 ppm. So it's not really an issue. How are Prop 65 requirements impacted if the manufacturer has a small manufacturer's exemption, especially for wooden toys or organic fabrics, such as cotton, silk, wool, or untreated leather? That's a very good question. So there is a, a very small manufacturer exemption, which I can't remember the numbers behind it. Um, but it's very small. However, they'll normally have bought it off a large retailer like Amazon, and then they'll prosecute Amazon, which you get dragged into. So it's a bit of a complicated problem because you're a small manufacturer, but they're a large entity. And so that is a way they often work around it, is to go after the retailer. So Amazon would try, try to say they're not a retailer for the stuff you sell on their platform, but legally in California, they are a retailer for Prop 65. So most prosecutions involve both the manufacturer and the retailer. Um, it's a lot easier to buy stuff online then go to each store and try to buy stuff. That's actually how most of the plaintiffs operate. Uh, one of the easiest ways to find out how, what your risk is, go to Amazon, type in your product and the word vinyl or brass. If it comes up, they're gonna prosecute it. It's actually that simple. They're pretty well guaranteed. They, they prosecute a hell of a lot more than that, but that's a pretty well guarantee. That's one of their main approaches because then they can get it shipped to them, which they can prove it was bought in the state of California. It's really convenient. They can show the history of where it was purchased as opposed to a brick and mortar sale where they have to have the receipt. They can actually show the, the receipt, online receipt from Amazon. They got it addressed to their address in California. It's just so much easier. For medical devices, can biocompatibility testing be leveraged to demonstrate no patient exposure issues, thus no labeling? Should be more conservative testing than any Prop 65 exposure testing, correct? No, medical is way less, way, way looser than Prop 65. Um, so you can use it, just realize that medical has a safety margin of 100. So whatever the daily exposure limit is, they divide it by 100, and that's the medical safety limit. The Prop 65 one's 1,000. So it's 10 times stricter. So you can use the same data, just realize that the limit is 10 times stricter for Prop 65. The safety factor is 1,000, uh, not 100. Um, it's a big difference. So it, you can use the data for sure for invasive situation, for example, but do realize that Prop 65 has a 10 times stricter limit. So whenever you look at a value, say it's one of the new ones, methyl acrylate, um, which if you used N hexane, you're going to get it because you just dissolve the layer of plastic. Um, you have to look at uh, the whatever limit you got, if it's good for medical, it's fine, except for it's 10 times stricter for Prop 65. So you have to, to add the 10 times limit. So do the time, it's gonna take one more. Um, sorry. How about antimony trioxide as part of a flame retardant system? It should be bound in the resin matrix, but can be released under high temperatures over time. Do I have to expect an exposure risk from that substance? And terminal trioxide is only inhalation risk, and unless you're using it at, in the burning, so anything that's burning, it's a different story. It's not its normal application. Uh, but terminal trioxide is inhalation only, so it has to be in a situation where inhalation is a, a possibility. It's it's not. It is. If it burns, it goes off in the gas. It's supposed to. It's actually how it works. Um, you take the bromine to flame retardant, it relaxes 
reacts to the hydrogen radical coming off the burning plastic, creates hydrogen bromide, absorbs some of the energy, the hydrogen bromide reacts to antimony trioxide, creates uh, antimony bromide and water and damps down the heat a lot more and that's how it works. So antimony trioxide comes off in the air during burning, but not in any appreciable manner otherwise, and it's not an inhalation risk. So we normally have inhalate antimony trioxide downgraded unless it's the inhalation risk, like it's in a filter of a PP or something like that. That's different, and we do an inhalation test. Well, that's it for today. I hope everybody enjoyed it. A lot of great questions at the end, for sure. I was going through things a lot of, very quickly. It kind of goes that way. Um, if you have any questions still or need help testing, just reach out. We'd be happy to help you. We do a lot of this. We kind of have fun, too, so it's a lot of good times. Um, everybody who registered should receive a copy of the slides, and there will be a recording online. By the way, all of our recordings for all our webinars are online. Um, we have a YouTube page. You can literally go in there. You can also turn me down to slower so I'm more understandable, uh, which a lot of people like, especially my mother. Um, not that she listened to me doing this. But um, thanks again, everybody, and I look forward to hosting everyone again soon.